Welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining. So I, I hope you and your families are all well at this time. It's certainly a worrying time for many reasons. Um, and throughout the UK lockdown, it's clear that technology has played a huge role in connecting us with colleagues, friends, <clears throat> and loved ones too. But there is a dark side to technology. Um, cybercrime is one, and there are other risks as well. And certainly, at this time, the last thing any business needs is, is a cyber attack or a data breach. The last thing anyone at home needs is to fall victim to a scam, to lose money, or worse still, to put themselves uh, at a greater risk of being infected with the coronavirus. So how do you stay safe um, at home and with your business? So thankfully, today we have three amazing Irwin Mitchell experts who can help uh, each in their areas. Uh, they are uh, Joanne Vaughan, who's a partner in data protection. Uh, Tash, if you mind just moving the, the slides uh, to the next slide. So we have uh, Georgie Collins, a partner in intellectual property, uh, Paz Matadi, a senior associate in employment, and myself, uh, Gwen Thompson, I'm the chief information security officer for the firm. So together, uh, we'd like to cover a question and answer session on various topics, including identifying cyber threats to your business, the data protection concerns with home working, establishing safe and secure working practices uh, for your people, plans to mitigate those risks, and how to guard against fraud and cyber crime at home. Now, I know I probably won't do this massive subject justice, but we'll do our best for you. Please feel free to ask any questions as we go, and I'll try and get them answered too. Uh, if you need any technical support, please follow the instructions on screen. There's a technical support button up there if you have any, any difficulties. So just uh, quickly as by way of an introduction, uh, before we get started, how exactly have the, the threats changed? I think people are very familiar with uh, the typical cyber threats data protection threats out there, but how, how have they really changed in the current circumstances? Well, all over the country, organizations are being tested really to the limits by the change in operational and financial challenges of the pandemic. Um, and if this isn't bad enough, there's been a huge spike in the level of cyber attacks and cyber enabled frauds uh, despite the crisis. Well, it, in fact, it's because of it. People are anxious, stressed, um, they're possibly doing even more work at home than normal, balanced, and family at home, and all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. Criminals are taking advantage of this situation, preying on people's fears. So, more specifically, uh, you may have seen in the news, the UK's action fraud in March alone saw 400% rise in coronavirus-related frauds, and this resulted in. A million, almost a million pound in losses in that month alone. More recently, uh, UK police revealed that UK firms and individuals lost more than uh, 1.86 million to coronavirus-related fraud since the crisis began. Most of this is due to uh, bogus companies selling non-existent or fake coronavirus-related products like masks and sanitizers. Uh, also. A BBC investigation found that last month criminals set up hundreds of new scam websites uh, to target businesses, hospitals and care homes looking to buy uh, bulk coronavirus related products. Uh, so the, the, the graph on the screen there at the end, that, that's what we see as uh, blocked income and malware in email. And we had a massive spike just at the start of the month. And this, this is typical across the board. Um, if you just move on to the, the next slide. That's it, thank you. Um, so phishing and email, uh, phishing email attacks, which is the most common type of cyber attack, uh, they've also reached new heights across the country. Um, so I've seen the spikes, for not, not just the stuff that was blocked, but the stuff that slipped the net. So we have a artificial intelligence tool that does some recognition of, a, of an email that got into someone's inbox, looks a bit suspicious to highlight it to them. And that has also had, had a massive spike over the recent weeks. Uh, 
Researchers also found nearly 400 new fishing domains with references to uh, medicines. Uh, medicines like uh, remdesivir, so that's how you pronounce it, and chloroquine. These are drugs that some countries are doing clinical trials on uh, to prevent or treat coronavirus. Um, and so this kind of fakery, this kind of fraud, it doesn't just hurt finances, it's putting lives at risk. Um, so if you just move on to slide five, please. So in uh, Irwin Mitchell, my team keeps an eye on the uh, cyber threat trends that we see to uh, facing our colleagues. And we keep track of it with situational awareness. So this is a typical, uh, a typical picture that we see each month, thousands and thousands of attacks of all types. And I can tell recently from our metrics that uh, most attacks have maintained roughly the same kind of figures, but as I've mentioned, phishing emails have, have really gone through the roof. There are, of course, other risks, uh, with the majority of the country now working at home, technology obviously being critical to enable home working, communication systems like, like Zoom, and we'll definitely talk about Zoom in a moment, remote access solutions, printing, and, and so on. So however useful and critical uh, these, these are, they need to be used securely. Uh, need to maintain privacy and compliance. And also, uh, finally, uh, we need to make sure that uh, there are safe and secure working practices as well as the well being of people at home. So now there is a lot, there is a lot there and a lot to discuss in a short space of time um, with, your, with your colleagues. Uh, and to do it remotely, that is no mean feat, um, but it certainly doesn't happen by accident. You need a plan. So if I can move on to uh, a Q&A, um, let's start with uh, Georgie. Uh, Georgie, what are the key reputational risks uh, to businesses in this crisis and, and, and what can they do? What should they do? So I, I think, afternoon everybody, um, three key risks really. These, there's the perceived lack of cyber resilience um, internally and externally in terms of just general business continuity and how fit for purpose an organisation is. Um, whilst there is some sympathy that we're all trying to cope in very fast moving and challenging times, now's the time when organisations, cyber resilience and risk planning has got to stand up to scrutiny. Um, the increased risk of fraud um, and whether how prepared a business can stand up to cyber criminals seeking to profit or indeed how prepared it is to deal with its own internal threat. Data and security, um, those organisations that didn't have significant remote working capabilities, they've had to invest quickly in acquiring and implementing technology are at a risk that such rapid rollout are going to be less robust um, than infrastructure changes that might have taken months or even years to test and roll out, meaning that personal data, preservation of confidential information, propriety, business information is really compromised what to do about it and how to manage the risk. Um, one of the key things is to revisit what the business continuity and cyber plan was in the first instance. Actually, is it still fit for purpose in this COVID environment? Has the risk matrix changed? The challenges, the threats are slightly skewed. Some are more prolific. We talked about fishing, Graham. Um, where they have changed, what are they now and what can you do to manage them? Most cyber risks security plans were not formulated with the prospect that all staff would be working from home and that an incident might come at a time when the infrastructure of the system was so overloaded and more vulnerable. So I think looking at your internal and external threats are critical to your risk management plan. Um, even the best IT systems with all the defense and monitoring systems that you can get are still subject to the vagaries of human error. So that's your people. Um, and we we regularly see that the biggest threat in terms of cyber security is people. Um, so there are some quite basic action points I think you can implement if you haven't already. Targeted additional awareness and communication to staff, including how to work securely from home, should be reinforced, along with targeted phishing campaigns using the sort of COVID-19 laws. Um, Ensuring that staff are reporting phishing emails so an organisation can manage and see what the type of threats are in the way that 
uh, Graham um, illustrated on the previous slide. So you can see the trends and you can get these added to your blacklist. When it comes to requests for personal or financial information or in particular requests to transfer money, making sure there's extra vigilance and specific guidance around what people should do. Um, we've already seen an increase in social engineering campaigns um, around COVID-19 in relation to requests to transfer for money. So looking what the protocols and payment review processes are within finance teams should definitely be looked at. Thinking about later down the line um, and depending how impacted your organisation is by the current environment, mitigating the increased risk of insider threats in the event of redundancy or termination, um, having plans so you can rapidly restrict on-notice employees' access to systems and data to reduce the risk of leakage um, of data and confidential information and that being misappropriated. Um, with organisations not being able to physically collect the devices from employees, thinking about your plans on um, disabling you know, logical access to physical devices, accounts and systems um, within those networks. In the event of an incident, um, back to revisiting your business continuity cyber security plan, but I would have thought immediate considerations would be thinking about can you coordinate the incident remotely? Have you got the necessary conferencing facilities? Come on to that in a minute. Um, and the access to incident management sites, processes and guides that you need. Are your facilities secure in order to manage such an event? Have you even tested it yet? Are you confident your backups are current and that in the worst case scenario, you can restore vital corporate data and systems and what's the time span for that? And how would you deal with a widespread ransomware event when most of your organization and workforce are working from home. They're my initial thoughts, Graham. So there's, there's a lot in there, and I've just been taking a few notes so I can summarize at the end. So thank you. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, and we certainly, yeah, we do, uh, as you mentioned, keep people, keep our colleagues on their toes with phishing testing. Um, in fact, the, the most recent one we did, we used uh, a genuine coronavirus-related phishing email that we received. Uh, we tested quite a number of, of colleagues on it. And the good news is the fail rate was extremely small. It was much, it was less than 1%, and the reporting rate was high. And you, only, you can only achieve that if you do regular testing and regular awareness. Um, so um, on data protection, uh, Joanne, what, what do you see the main data security concerns with using new technology, say for remote access, uh, remote working? Yeah, I think, I think there are a number of things that people um, need to think about. And I think one of the risks which are people are sort of rushing to implement new technology and sort of new solutions to enable their the workforce to work from home. And that's sort of understandable, but one of the things that does need to be think, thought about is security. And I think that's one of the areas where the ICO is, is not being um, flexible. They are being helpful in, in other areas, which we can sort of talk about later. But one of the things that they do expect is that you will always have security that is appropriate to the data um, that you're using. Um, be it at home or be it at work, and, and the position hasn't changed. So you, even if you were sort of working from home pre the crisis and um, in coffee shops or on trains, you had to have appropriate security and they still expect that now. And I think that's one of the things that people sometimes overlook when they're rushing to sort of adopt new technology in making sure that it does still provide appropriate security so that you can show that you've um, met that requirement. I think one of the other things that people um, in their rush to sort of implement things, and I, I've certainly seen this in my practice in that I'm asked to sort of sign off on um, contract terms within 24 hours, are the, the mandatory provisions that you have to have in contracts to deal with data protection, particularly where you've got a processor. And I think people just need to, while I understand that you do need to implement things really, really quickly, data protection is still an issue and compliance will still be an issue and the ICO will still expect compliance to be an issue. So you do still need to look at security. You do still need to think about what those terms need to be. You need to do your due diligence. You need to understand where the data is being stored. Is it being stored offshore? And I think they're the, the main sort of things that people need to think about. Um, I think from a security point of view and data protection, it is 
um, business as usual. Um, you need to think about the same sort of things you think about if you were um, implementing it in the office under normal circumstances. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, certainly with communication systems, I mean, what, what do you think about tools like, you know, and I'll, I'll use Zoom as an, an, an example, I have a few questions on that, um, where researchers seem to think that uh, the encryption keys are, are, are sent to servers in China because they have Chinese developers working working on it. What, what, what would that mean for data protection for UK citizens? I think you need to understand, as I say, where the data might be going. And if it is going offshore, there are rules from a data protection point of view to make sure that people are protected in the same way as if it were kept onshore. So I think even though obviously we're in extraordinary times, you can't just not ask those sort of questions. You need to understand what will be happening and, as you say, you know, delving into not only where the data might be going or various things might be going, but also what the security um, of these systems are. And I know that there's an awful lot of different views as to what sort of video conferencing systems people should be using. But my main thing, um, and I'll leave the sort of technical sort of side of things to you, um, Graham, because that's not my bag, but in terms of, you know, what you should be thinking about is, um, doing appropriate due diligence, digging into these things, not just sort of running at it and sort of signing on the dotted line really, really quickly, because it could come and bite you in the long term in terms of, you know, if, for example, it's being sent offshore and it's not being protected properly, the personal data and the data breach issues, or people start complaining about how their data is used, um, the ITO will still action um, complaints that are coming from people. And so you might have moved really, really quickly to implement these things, but in the long term, you might be facing complaints um, to the ICO or the com or the ICO looking at data breaches. So, uh, as I say, I, I do think you still need to sort of take a step back and understand all the background and do proper due diligence. Albeit, I suspect it'll be a lot quicker than you'd normally do, but you still need to do it. Mm -hmm. So, so what kind of risks are, are, are companies exposing themselves to if, say, the they, they they didn't do appropriate due diligence and they say colleagues were using a communication product that was that was free to use so they didn't have a contract uh, in place you know what what kind of risk does that create i think the risk that are created and say is that if you've not sort of looked into it and you don't know what's happening and colleagues have just picked their own because you know joe down the pub said it was a good idea to go with it um, you could find out, for example, that people's data is being misused and then they get find out about it, they make complaints. could also find out that you end up um, with a data breach because the, the sort of system that's been selected doesn't have the right sort of levels of security and suddenly all sorts of sensitive information is being exposed. And obviously, you know, some businesses will have more sensitive information, personal data, than others will. But nonetheless, you know, and in particular, I would say to those businesses who have got a lot of um, particularly special category sensitive data or financial data, they need to be more careful than others. Um, but if it, it, it could result um, in a data breach. And one of the things that certainly the ICO like to know is if there's been a data breach and it involves a contractor of yours, they will ask um, what due diligence you have done. They will ask what the terms were in the contract whether or not you've got proper processor terms and things like that. And I've seen that um, previously where there have been either complaints or there have been data breaches involving um, contractors, software providers, people like that. So it's not a case of the ICO don't know what's going on. They will ask some uncomfortable questions. And if you don't have the right answers for them, um, you will find that they are less sympathetic than if you say, I did my due diligence, I did have the right provisions in the contract, I thought I did think that you know it wasn't going to be something that would result in a data breach. They will sort of accept that the data breach, if it happens, it could be one of those things. If you've not done the due diligence, then they'll sort of see it as a sort of endemic failure within the business that they've not even done the due diligence, and therefore you know it's one of it, you, you would expect it to happen. They'll be much less sympathetic in that situation. Okay, thank you. Well, before we go back to. Um, to some security related questions, just wanted to ask uh, Padma, from an employment point of view, what kind of uh, risks are companies being exposed to if they've got colleagues working at home 
um, if they're not really been geared up for that before. Yeah, well, I think even um, businesses that have probably worked agile for some time um, still haven't necessarily experienced what we're experiencing at the moment in the number of roles that, that are going to be at home. And so um, businesses may have things like home working policies and things like that, but it may not necessarily be as detailed to encompass what we're currently seeing and, and then, as I say, the number of different roles that are having to, to work at home. So I think um, the, the main exposure tends to be around the, the use of confidential information, how that's being um, processed, looked at, um, we're obviously all at home with other hard children running around. And um, so have staff been given correct guidance in relation to when they're processing or having confidential conversations, where they're having them, what they're doing with their computer, are they locking it down when they walk away from the computer in the same way that you sort of say it in, in the office. Um, and also we're seeing lovely weather at the moment and um, with people being cooped up, but the temptation is to, to work outside in the garden. But if you, you're getting calls in, are, are people overhearing confidential calls? Um, I have an interesting question in relation to um, Alexa's being uh, in people's homes and whether mm -hmm. Alexa's picking up on conversations. So yeah. what are we asking staff in relation to that? Are we asking them to don't know, put it in the garden shed or something whilst yeah. you're working? So it's, it's those sorts of factors that I think employers probably need to map out um, looking at the types of roles that are being worked on whilst at home and, and how they're protecting that information. And I know Joanne and I had a conversation the other day just in relation to um, paperwork. Normally when you're in the office, you'll have a confidential bin that you put everything into. Um, and so what, what is staff doing at the moment? Clearly not to put it in their uh, home waste um, with everything else. So there's lots of different issues there that employers probably need to have a think about, think about codifying it in some sort of policy so that people understand what the expectations are of them. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got a whole raft of policies that either you re update and re-communicate, um, or if you haven't got them, you've got to put them together and let people know. Um, interesting that you mention Alexa and such uh, devices. It's certainly something my team has been asked about before. Um, my, my own view on them is that the current research is that uh, because the 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 listening cycles are three seconds, but they don't they don't send the data anywhere uh, unless you make it a command. Uh, and obviously, if you if you make a command, even by accident or uh, as occasionally happens, uh, it mishears a word you've said and thinks it's a command. Uh, that that's where uh, you then potentially have a have a short conversation sent there. So I would uh, picking up on what Joanne said. It's you know I would say. That's the kind of thing a, a, a company would need to risk assess, come up with their own view on it that's, that's documented and put that into one of the, the policies that's then communicated to colleagues. Um, interestingly, you can, uh, things like Alexa and the, uh, the Google one, they're not just for devices that sit in your, your living rooms and your kitchens, you can, have, you can have them on your phone. So the same risk can, can apply to, to phones as well. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, just wanted to, to go back uh, to to Georgie and just talk about supplier risk. So, you know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned resilient uh, resilient uh, backup. Uh, business continuity kind of plan to make sure that they're up to speed. But you could do you you could have all thing and all dance and uh, backups and business continuity policies for your own firm. But if you've got critical suppliers that that are at risk, how how do you deal with that? Uh, that's a good point. And actually, assessing who your critical suppliers are is is one of the first things to do, and often isn't always identified um, in the context of a crisis that wasn't foreseen, might be in terms of basic IT suppliers, but um, in terms of supply chain, manufacturing, what we're dealing with at the moment, what was a critical supplier, you know, 
three months ago might not be seen in that vein now. So assessing who your critical suppliers is, is critical. Um, and the thinking through of how are you going to manage if they're unable to operate, um, whether that's through some sort of business disruption or if they come under financial pressure and themselves can, can no longer operate. Um, so looking at what alternative options are to reduce that dependency um, and discussing implications with your key suppliers um, around what their business continuity is and where they are at in, 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 in this current crisis and have they in turn got the right point of supply chain down the line? Okay, so yeah, it's, and again, it's, it's something that, that, that we were looking at for our own firm and yeah, exactly as you've, you've described, we've been using our critical supply list, making sure we contact suppliers, ask them the right questions about their, their, their operations and take any risk back to the state the stakeholders. Okay. Um, what one thing that might be of interest in this sort of situation, a partner you might be able to help is if 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 you have an outsourced arrangement where the the, the third party is 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 say at risk of not surviving the crisis, are there any uh, employment law requirements that that a company would have to be aware of, like anything to do with two P? Possibly. It, it depends upon um, what services are, are being provided um, and to, to what extent, um, if that company cannot fulfil them, you're going to take them back in-house. Um, because if suddenly you say, well, fine, that company that currently uh, provided that service to us can no longer do it, we've got some capacity or we're going to, because we've seen a downturn in, in other parts of our business, we're going to ask some of our staff to step in and it's a way of avoiding redundancy within our own organisation. Um, then, yes, you, you may have some cheap, cheapy implications of those individuals saying, well, actually, it's just the same work that I was doing for, through your outsourced provider that you're now doing exactly the same way in-house back in your organisation, so I should come to your, your organisation and be employed by your organisation. Mm -hmm. It's GP is, uh, is quite complex, um, mm -hmm. and so with, with something like that, I would always recommend that, that detailed advice is taken because it, it can go many different routes and angles depending upon slight different variations. Okay. Thank you. Um, just before I move on to some other questions, we've had uh, some questions from uh, participants. So uh, one of them is uh, the use of email encryption. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. So col colleagues are at home. Um, if you want to ensure confidentiality of uh, the emails you send, because obviously emails natively uh, are like sending a postcard uh, it written in pencil. So encryption is used to protect that information, make sure that only the recipient can read it. But it's always, uh, as with security, it's never that straightforward. So uh, this individual is saying we've had an issue with Recipients can open the email, uh, mostly when accessing the email from a smartphone. Uh, so, what do we what do we um, suggest to mitigate that? Well, uh, so firstly, and and what we have here is have a, a policy on email encryption that so that colleagues understand in a very layman terms way what is required to be encrypted and, and what isn't, because not everything needs to be encrypted and kind of base that on information classification. So, you know, in military terms, you got secret, top secret or public, um, and you would want to send certain, conf certain confidential information to be encrypted. It's also uh, a requirement or a suggestion by the ICO, maybe Joanne can talk about that in a second. Um, so, there's lots of different ways of doing it. There are paid for tools, there's some freebies, but ultimately, um, if you use a, a particular tool, as, as this person is finding, sometimes the recipients don't have that tool, they, they, they can't open the, the encrypted email, uh, or they have to download something, and a lot of companies stop downloads of stuff that they don't know about, for very good, legit reasons. In fact, if you, uh, if you prevent uh, colleagues from just downloading anything and installing it with that uh, group policy setting, you'll mitigate 85% of malware risk. 
So it's a pretty strong control. You don't want to be lifting that. So one way of dealing with this is is you having a plethora, having a few different methodologies to encrypt uh, documents, encrypt emails, because your uh, your 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 clients, your third parties that you deal with, might have different things that they can handle. So at the very simplest level, you've got native password protection. Uh, so things like Word documents and spreadsheets, uh, PDFs, you can. Uh, you can put passwords on that. Obviously, they're only as strong as the password, so you'd have a password policy along with that. And then also only as strong as how you get the password to the recipient. No point in putting it in the same email if that went to the wrong person that was, was compromised. Uh, you want to send it separately, ideally through a different channel. Um, so there are some complexities there, but essentially it's having different options, putting it in a really easy guide and uh, like uh, Padma said, having, having a policy on it and communicating it to colleagues. Um, Joanne, just, have you got any comment on email encryption that, that, that the ICO would be interested in? Yeah, I mean, the ICO likes encryption, um, to be fair. And I think, again, it's a matter of common sense in terms of what the content of the email is. And if you're communicating something that is sensitive either from a personal data point of view, which is the sort of thing I'm looking at, but also from a company confidential point of view, it's certainly something that should be considered. And the ICO, for example, one of the things they don't like is if somebody, and we've seen this before, somebody makes a subject access request and the recipient collates all the information and then sends out basically all the information they've got about the individual, which includes sensitive information, all their employment history, et cetera, just by email without any encryption. And that's certainly not something that the ICO would be very happy about. So I think um, I, I completely agree with what you, you've said, Graham. You know, if I'm inviting Padma out for lunch, then I don't need to encrypt it. But if I'm sending you something um, confidential outside the business, then yeah, it, it is certainly something that people should genuinely think about because the ICO will expect you to think about things like that, um, depending on what the nature of the data is that you're sending around. Thanks. Um... And, and Georgie, the uh, just a part of that, Irina talked about uh, email encryption tools, and there's, you know, at times when people are working from home, what we found is ha uh, companies having to work very quickly to find uh, tools. Some of them are free phone apps that people can use to enable the, the, the business so that they can actually work. Um, what are the what are the risks around that? You know, if someone was just to download and start using a free app? I think the, the concern that we see um, is introducing, you know, malware into your IT, um, in, into your IT system, or because you've not had time to go through those typical testing trialing systems, you've got certain back doors that, that are open that as a result of that type of software, expose further vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, people don't think about that when they're, they're in the faster now that they're in. What they're trying to do is find a, a solution. And we've seen all sorts of organizations who are, are really challenged where um, they particularly haven't thought around video conferencing on a significant scale and they don't have a preferred system in place or it's not suitable for large numbers of people remote working. So people take to their own preferred methods. Um, for example, Zoom, um, which of course we've touched on before and um, to which there are all sorts of concerns about. I mean, just more broadly, um, in terms of people being in that kind of video conferencing environment, um, we saw, we've saw seen all sorts of stuff on social media where people are celebrating the fact that, you know, they are getting online, they're kind of having that face-to-face, -face, but people then forget their basic security measures mm -hmm. because they're in this new environment and, you know, they're exposing their conference ID. Um, we saw that happen actually with the Prime Minister just a week before he went into hospital. So, again, that vigilance um, around your security environment is key, even when, you know, you have verified the type of system that you're going to be using. Is that probably, it's probably a good time to talk about Zoom, Graham? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Zoom, uh, since, uh, since the lockdown, uh, there's not a day gone by that I haven't been asked about Zoom in particular. In fact, I've been dreaming about Zoom. Um, <laughs> so, 
the the the, the 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 long and short of it, like many systems, is that they can be they can be used securely, but they can also be used with either uh, user error or just a lack of awareness. They can be used insecurely, um, as Joanne said. If you do use any particular tools and it's just, uh, and it's used for personal data, then you know you are required to do a, a privacy impact assessment and due diligence. So Zoom. Um, the, the, the issues with Zoom are largely around privacy, simply from the point of view that you can create a, a meeting that anyone can join. So you can publish a very short digit uh, code and people can join it. That's kind of how it's intended to be used. But you can increase the, the privacy by putting a password on it, which if you want a private meeting, that's definitely what, what you should do. Um, you also have additional controls within as a, if you host an, a meeting, so you have controls like uh, turn meeting participants, uh, ensuring that everyone that joins goes in the waiting room. Uh, you have to turn that on. Uh, things like uh, if you, you, you might have, say, a meeting ID that you use for your team quiz every Friday. No one's going to be, you know, no one's going to be too upset if if more people join that than what you were intending, you know, as long as they behave themselves. But you don't want to use that same meeting ID for your private meetings that you don't want everyone to join. So use a different meeting ID and and put a password on it. Um, you can knock people off it, you know, if they're, if they're misbehaving and mute people. Um, so there are various things that you can do. To make it more secure, because as I say, some products, not not just products like Zoom, all sorts of products um, have issues where if you just don't put the security settings in place, um, they can be quite insecure. So, in fact, one of the uh, one of the biggest risks for any online system, so that this was what the National Cyber Security found recently. Uh, the biggest risk to any business is with an online account, and it's through hacking of that account because you can access it with just the username and password. So what they do is uh, the criminals do is a thing called password stuffing. So they take a list of, and there are lists out there of literally three odd billion email address and password combinations that have been collated together from previous breaches, things like LinkedIn years ago, all sorts of stuff. Um, they, they'll then ram that through an automated system into a website where it's just a username and password to access it. And if the site isn't configured to be resistant to that, and it's actually quite hard to do, uh, the, the criminals can find combinations that work. So they can then either sell those as accounts that actually work, um, or they can then breach that account, or they can just figure out that uh, that. Graham Thompson, with a particular email address, always uses a similar password. They can now try other systems that they haven't had breaches for to get in. And if, if I've used the same password reuse, which obviously in your policies you'd advise colleagues not to do, uh, you're, you're at risk. So one of the, the strongest things any business should do right now is make sure that all critical systems that are accessed via uh, the internet are two-factor authentication. So it's not just the username and password, it's actually got uh, the code or, or a text back or just something that means if your email address and password are compromised, they still can't get in. That is the, the biggest uh, risk there. And someone was asking the other, the other sort of key cyber risks. So uh, we've, we've mentioned quite a few, but from the the National Cyber Security Centre, they list uh, cloud services hacks as number one. Number two is ransomware, which is still a thing. Um, the companies are still being attacked with that. In fact, a recent one was a Zoom invite. So you get a Zoom invite, uh, you click on it, you've got to download something to access it, and it's not Zoom, it's ransomware. So uh, you, you, you still need Typical controls for that, so things like stopping users being able to just download and, and install any software. That'll get rid of most of your risk. You obviously want to make sure your antivirus is up to date. Um, disabling macros in Office products uh, is is another key one. Um, there's just quickly go through the others. There's phishing, which is at number three, um, and as we previously discussed, that has gone through the roof recently. 
all sorts of phishing emails, lots of coronavirus related emails. Um, and something I've seen um, uh, uh, as well is just your typical bog standard phishing emails on personal level, things like uh, your Netflix account's been hacked, click here, and it's, it's a fake site, or your Amazon account, anything to try and steal your credentials. Um, you've also got supply chain risk, um, which, which we've mentioned, uh, and of course, uh, a key couple of key things there to mitigate or to uh, risk assess any new suppliers that are using any new products, um, and also to assess your current supply chain for uh, risk, particularly at this time, um, if they're at risk of not surviving the crisis. Um, and of course, one, one thing now, and uh, Joanne mentioned this, home physical security. Um, you know, people are now at home dealing with their IT assets, paper documents, uh, voice and video calls. Now, not everyone can quietly uh, shut the door in the West Wing drawing room and uh, get absolute privacy. You know, we, we'll, we'll have colleagues who live in uh, flats with, with people they don't necessarily know, with thin walls, uh, these people with kids around running in and out of meetings. Colleagues have just got to be aware of what, they, what can they do um, to, to minimize risk, to remain compliant. And as Padma said, that is through uh, policies that get communicated to the individual. Um, so we're just getting up to uh, 15 minutes beforehand. Um, so one of the one of the questions was around uh, health and safety. Now, uh, maybe Padma, maybe you could help with this. Uh, is there anything that uh, businesses need to consider with 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 people walking at home? Things like health and safety, things like the equipment they use. Um, do companies have to pay for certain things if people are now are now using that at home? Yeah, well, I, I think it's it's probably twofold. There's the the physical aspect of the the equipment, but also just the the mental health and, and safety of individuals being at home in in a situation that that not many of us are used to. So I think dealing with that one first is. Um, having a plan in place of how you're keeping in touch with staff um, and looking after their, their health and well-being from that perspective and, and making sure you're checking in because it's quite easy um, to, when you're not necessarily travelling in and out to a workspace, of just constantly sitting on your laptop, doing work, not having sufficient rest breaks, um, being burnt out, stressed, etc., which in turn can have a knock-on impact of of people doing things that, that might be um, out of the norm in terms of accidentally clicking on a link that they know they shouldn't be clicking on and, and downloading software that they shouldn't be because they're not necessarily thinking in, in the same way that they would be. So um, looking at strategies in relation to that, and then in terms of the physical hardware aspects, yeah, again, think about what equipment you're providing and what is necessary for, for someone to do their role. And I guess if it is something that you need them to fundamentally do their role as an employer, you're going to have to provide that for them to be able to, to do that work. Um, but in some instances, you, you may ask them to, to use their own devices, and that's where it then goes into Joanne's territory of well, if they are using their devices, what guidance are you giving them about security um, and all the things that sit around there? Um, but from a health and safety point of view, um, ACAS has, has recently published some guidance in relation to, to that. Um, and it all sits around liaising with your health and safety officer um, because naturally you're not going to be able to go out to everyone's home to check that their computer is set up correctly um, and so on. So is there something that you can issue in terms of giving them guidance of don't necessarily just sit on your sofa using your laptop, but maybe think about doing X, Y, and Z. Um, and actually, um, the Institute of Occupational Health and Safety have also issued a checklist, um, which if you've not seen that, I would definitely recommend you go on, have a look, download the checklist and maybe even give it out to staff and um, to have a look at to do a, a, an individual risk assessment themselves and to contact HR or someone appointed within your organisation if they've got any concerns so you can address those that way. 
So sorry, where, where was that checklist? Um, it's the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Okay. The one thing that the Health and Safety Executive are quite clear about is that you, if it's a temporary work from home situation, the, the obligations to do those um, DSE assessments aren't quite as high as they are if someone's permanently working at home. Um, but I think my main, my main point to take away is just make sure you are checking in with staff and liaising with your internal health and safety officer and um, to make sure you, you're doing as much as you can to support mm -hmm. both mentally and physically. So, you know, given that uh, everyone or most people are, are working from home and probably quite successfully as well, how after the crisis is over and people can return to work, how should companies deal with, with people that now think, actually, I can work from home, I need one flexible work in? Yeah, I, I can certainly think that we are going to get a rise in, in flexible working requests because I think people have, have seen the, the nicety of not necessarily having to sit in traffic every day and, and go into a physical office. And I think um, typically there's a lot of roles that people are now working and doing at home that traditionally may not have been seen as a home role or um, managers who weren't used to that role being at home and um, sort of saying, well, that's not the way we do it. But actually, it's now proved that possibly that role can be done at home. Um, so I agree with you, Graham, that we're probably going to start seeing a lot more flexible work requests. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's work from home. It could be changes to working hours and working flexibly that way. So again, we're seeing people, especially with childcare needs, saying, well, I know I'm typically work nine to five. That isn't going to be possible with the children running around. So I need to be a bit more flexible and log on, say, at seven, eight o'clock once they're, they're in bed and, and catch up on certain things. So it, I think we are going to see an increase in that. Um, and my tips in relation to that is, if you've got a flexible working policy, make sure you're following it to avoid any um, breach of contract claim um, and also any other ancillary claims that may come out of it. Um, think about trial periods, um, and this is obviously a, a great trial period to be using to see how it works and, and stretching that to the limit. Um, but if a request comes in, they need to deal with it in accordance with their policy or there is a um, legislative framework in the Employment Rights Act that people would need to follow. Um, in, in summary, anyone who has at least 26 weeks service, haven't, haven't made a request within the last 12 months, can make a request. Um, historically, it used to be you could only make a request if you had childcare reasons or looking after a disabled relative, whereas now that, that requirement has been removed, so it can be from anyone for any reason whatsoever. Um, so I think maybe now have a think about if those, if and when those claims come through and requests come through of how you're going to deal with them, how you're going to deal with them fairly. Um, and obviously it's going to be a lot harder to turn down requests than it previously may have been. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we've just got 10 minutes to go. There are some questions that I'll go through in, in a few minutes, but I just wanted, uh, if anyone's got any final thoughts, uh, Georgie? Um, planning and vigilance. Absolutely, yeah. And Joanne? Um, yeah, one of the things I did want to mention, Graham, which hopefully people will find helpful, is I appreciate sometimes sounds a bit like the voice of doom when I'm sort of talking about what the ICO expects you to do. Um, they have recognised um, that it is an extraordinary time, and they issued some guidance yesterday, which people might find useful, called How Will We Regulate? And they've said that if the current crisis is causing problems, so for example, you've not got the staff or the um, resources to be able to respond to a subject access request in time, they will take that into consideration. Um, and they will be sympathetic, maybe if you're slightly slower in terms of reporting a data breach. The key point to it is, though, um, you've got to be able to demonstrate that it is the crisis that means you're slow, not that you're just a bit useless in terms of managing timescales and things like that. But I think it is quite helpful for people who are concerned that they may not have, you know, with everyone working from home, access to all the records they need or the right people to do stuff um, for a full compliance thing. So I would definitely suggest if anybody's at all interested, 
and are concerned about how the ICO might react to where they are in terms of working from home, but they have a quick look at it. It's on the ICO website, and it does. Um, it, it is. I think it's quite a helpful document. That's brilliant. Thank you. So we have uh, we have a question about conducting pen testing uh, and security testing during the current pandemic. So uh, yeah, is the answer to that. So uh, obviously any kind of penetration testing or vulnerability scanning, uh, you would go through your, your normal change process just to make sure everyone's aware of it. But if you're not doing it, the enemy are doing it. So one thing that's been noticed by the National Cyber Security Center is, uh, well, certain foreign governments, there'll be of no surprise, uh, China in particular and, and others, are scanning for remote access vulnerabilities. So there was one in Citrix earlier in the year, fact, it was discovered in December, uh, that there was a unpatchable weakness that could have uh, resulted in uh, access into someone's network remotely. Uh, Citrix did have a fix for it, and round about the same time that uh, everyone would be putting their fixes in, uh, there was actually exploitable code came out. And while most people, it seems, had fixed it, but some hadn't, and uh, various uh, various sort of hacking groups are scanning for those vulnerabilities, uh, not just in Citrix, but also in RDP, which is the, for remote access. So any kind of those uh, network solutions used for remote access, they're going to be getting a lot more attention. So one good way uh, of uh, finding out proactively if you've got any problems on that front is to do your pen testing or vulnerability scanning of your external facing IP ranges. Um, yeah, I would, that's, that's definitely something that should be kept up even during this time. Other security testing, like Georgie mentioned, uh, phishing awareness testing, yeah, that, that should definitely be uh, kept up or increased at this time, especially using any sort of examples of real uh, phishing tests. And, you know, this isn't about catching people out. This isn't about embarrassing people. This is about keeping everyone on the toes, keeping them aware, making sure that all those policies and procedures you've got uh, get dusted off and that colleagues can actually be aware of them, they, they, they know that they're there. Um, and a really good way of doing that is when they, they get a little bit caught out with, say, a phishing test, and then they can read or, or view the, the information that, that, that you send them. Um, and just lastly, one of the other uh, questions there was just about cyber security at home. How can you help your own people, uh, yourselves and your, and your families at home? Um, so just very quickly, again, some of the biggest threats are very similar to uh, those faced by businesses, internet account hacks. So uh, if you've got um, lots of online accounts, including things like your, your social media accounts, your video conferencing accounts, just again, be very sensible with the usernames and passwords. So don't reuse your passwords, you know, just try to uh, let, let people know at home. Um, you can use something like uh, Have I Been Pawned, so E-W-N-E-D. If you just Google Have I Been Pawned, you'll find it run by uh, Troy Hunt in Australia. This is a, a big list. You know, I talked about those 3 billion username password combinations. Uh, well, the good guys have that as well, and you can actually check your email address on it to see if you've been compromised, if your password is being used by criminals, you can actually check your passwords, do your own little risk assessment if you're happy to do that, but I've, I've looked at it and I'm happy to do it. Uh, and if anything comes up, you want to change your passwords. Uh, you've also got phishing, phishing emails, calls and texts. Same, same applies as in, as in business, just be vigilant about it. Um, if something looks too good to be true, it probably is. If it's trying to panic you, claims to be uh, the National Crime Agency requiring a payment for something, it isn't going to be them. It's just being sensible, Googling the text, just to be sure quite often you can find uh, the you can find the truth behind it there. Protecting your mobiles, your laptops and desktops at home from malicious uh, software. You know, ransomware is still a thing for people at home. So yeah, um, you, you want to make sure you've got up-to-date antivirus. 
Um, and even if you're on a Mac, you want to make sure that you've in the settings you've ticked to only allow software from the App Store to run, and that will give you added protection there. Big one for people at home: scams and shopping, uh, online shopping scams. Big one at the minute, particularly around coronavirus-related products. And if that that is just purely sense checking things, being aware anything that looks too good to be true or is trying to panic you is not going to be true. And there's a lot of good information on Get Safe Online uh, that people at home can go to. And and the last one is just protecting your finances. So. Uh, Keep an a look at your, your credit your credit statement, which you can do for free with things like call credit, Equifax, Clear Score. Um, that's the kind of last check that makes sure your your finances are up to speed. Okay, well, that takes us uh, to the end of the Q and A. I know there's probably hours and hours worth of uh, <laughs> of stuff that we could still go through, but uh, I think thank you. Uh, Joanne, Georgie, and Padma for that. That was much appreciated and really uh, fascinating there. So, essentially, in, in, in summary, these are fast moving times, and now is the time to put your risk mitigation in place if you hadn't done already. Speed is the savior, but also the enemy. Uh, the speed that people want to be uh, adapting to working at home. Uh, so, revisit and update your resilience plans, focus on uh, the key threats, and human error is still a major factor there. Uh, make sure your incident management is still up to speed, still effective, and still relevant to the new ways of, of working. Um, keep staff on the toes with phishing email testing, regular training. Strengthen your financial processes so don't fall victim to the fake CEO fraud. You know, send them an email saying, I need to send a million pounds to this account, otherwise, we're in trouble. You know, have sensible financial checks, data protection. The ICO is not being flexible with cybersecurity in particular. Uh, they expect this still to be appropriate. Data protection compliance is often overlooked with contracts being missed or on ineffective terms and doing due diligence. Um, create and communicate staff policies, particularly covering confidentiality, things like secure destruction and uh, working at home. Seek expert advice where it is complex, or particularly if it's navigating laws. Uh, look after your colleagues' well-being is, is probably going to be first and foremost as well. ACAS have published guidance on home working, and there's some health and safety information at the uh, Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, plan for a rise in requests for home working and flexible working when all this is as calmed down. Um, and have a look at the ICU's website as well. Lots of uh, good information there that will help keep you uh, safe and compliant. So, um, if you want to learn more, there's huge amounts of information on our website there, erwinmitchell.com, uh, for personal legal services as well as, as business legal services. Um, and if you've got any feedback, uh, please feel free to email us. Um, if you want any help or if you've got any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them afterwards uh, via email as well. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, really appreciate that. I hope it's been interesting for everyone listening, and uh, we'll see you again sometime.